All right. Well, it's good to be together with the men. And as Rob said, we're going to talk about discipling tonight. You know, a lot of you guys have heard multiple lessons on discipling, you know, whether that's just in college or when you were in high school as well. Um, and we did do a lesson last semester on the importance of discipling relationships. Um, and so some of this will, you know, um, you'll remember from that lesson, but um, I want to, I want this time to also be a little bit more interactive. And so we're also going to have a time as part of the lesson towards the, the later part of the lesson where I'm going to ask you guys some questions and uh, just to share vulnerably about some things that um, have to do with discipling and going after it. And so uh, just a heads up on that, that part of this time will be some uh, discussion, uh, not the whole time, but part of it will be. Um, but you guys can be turning in your Bibles over to John chapter 13. We're going to look in John 13, 34 in a second. If you're able to turn your video on, that's awesome. If not, all good. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm excited to be preaching tonight. So a couple weeks back, we finished up um, a series on practicing the way of Jesus, right? You guys remember that? Hopefully you do. Um, and it was an awesome time. And, you know, we talked about being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus and doing what Jesus did, right? That's, that's what we were talking about. And uh, let me just do something real quick. All right. Um, and so we had an awesome series, three parts going through that. And we talked about the importance of focusing and, and centering our lives around following Jesus, right? Knowing his teachings and living them out um, and re reordering our lives in a way that we can really be with Jesus each day. We can become like him. We can do what he did. But we're called to practice the way of Jesus with one another together as brothers in Christ, in community, in brotherhood, right? You can't practice the way of Jesus on your own. I can't practice the way of Jesus on my own. It's not in the Bible. It's not what Christianity is all about. Christianity, even that word Christian, comes from Acts 11 when a community is having a presence in a city as they're following Jesus together. So this whole origin of the idea of Christianity comes from doing it together. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Jesus has a really important teaching here in John chapter 13. And we see a lot of scriptures throughout the, the Gospels in the New Testament with this phrase, one another, right? Uh, God calls us to love one another, to encourage one another, to be patient with one another, to bear with one another, right? But this scripture we're going to see a, a specific thing that Jesus calls us to do for one another. So let's read John 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus says, a new command I give you, A-O-N-Y-C men, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We'll stop there. So Jesus is saying, hey, I have a new command for you. You ready for this? Love one another. And in that moment, they, may, they might be like, what, aren't we always called to love one another? Is this new? But then he says, no, no, let me tell you, as I have loved you, you must love one another. How did Jesus love us on this Zoom call? Well, he lived 33 years sinless, saying no to sin, suffering, and dying on a cross. That's how he loved you. He poured himself out, his blood, his sweat, his tears, his emotions, everything. He laid down his life. And he says, that love that I have, you need to love each other with the same love. That's the bar that Jesus sets, right? That's the standard he sets. And he says, if you do that, everyone is going to know that you are practicing the way of Jesus, that you're my disciple. So that's a high bar that Jesus sets. But I think we got to start there. That's square one. This is what we're called to, brothers. 
is to lay down our lives for each other, to love each other with the same love that Jesus has for us and displayed in the Gospels. Right? That's challenging, right? But that's what we have to realize is the standard. It's not just to have a weekly D time and talk about, you know, a couple hobbies on Sunday or check in with each other. It's to love each other with the love of Jesus. You know, that, that phrase, one another, it's two words in English, but it's one word in Greek. It's this word, alelon. And it's used a hundred times in 94 New Testament verses. verses. That phrase, one another. Right. And 47 of those times in those, you know, 94 verses is instructions to disciples, is to in, instructions to the church, people like us, uh, a community of Christians. Right. And so that that word, alone or one another, it's talking about, hey, it's mutual, it's reciprocal, it's a two way street. Both people are doing their part in the friendship. And so that's what we're called to, guys, is this one another way. You know, another way you could um, label discipleship or another term you could use is the one another way that Jesus displayed with his disciple, doing life with them, loving one another, being with one another, right? You know, another term that people use for disciple is, is mentoring, right? Who's your spiritual mentor? Uh, other times, it might be more of a peer relationship, and you're both uh, sharpening one another and you're helping one another grow. Um, you know, sometimes people like using the, the phrase like a trainer or a coach or your spiritual advisor, but it's someone that you're following Jesus with, whether that's your, your, you know, learning from one another together, or there's someone who's ahead of you in the faith or older and you're learning from them and they're your discipler, right? But this is what we're called to. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Ephesians 4, 22. Because this is another scripture that I think can set the standard and really kind of answer the question of, all right, Mark, yeah, I, I know discipling is good, but, um, but why? Why do I need to be discipled? Why do I need to learn how to disciple others? Like, why? What's the point? Why are we talking about this every semester, right? Well, let's talk about it. Ephesians 4, verse 22. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. Just do something quick. I had to let someone into the women's call. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Okay, so this is Paul writing to disciples in Ephesus, right? And imagine he's writing this to us, right? Imagine this says to AONYC, AONYC chapter 4 verse 22, and Paul's saying, hey guys, you guys were taught in regard to your former way of life, and you were taught in those Bible studies you had to put off the sin, right? To put off your old self, which was being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds. And Paul's saying to us, and God's saying to us, put on the new self. And who is that new self created to be in Christ? Created to be like God. G-O-D. Not just a better version of yourself, not just a good guy, not more like a, a Christian you look up to, but to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So why do we need discipling? You can't become like God on your own. I can't become like Jesus on my own. I can't do this by myself, putting on the new self, turning away from my deceitful desires. I got blind spots. I don't know about you, right? This scripture is telling you what your purpose is. You're created to be like God. And God has made the path to that 
or the way we get there is in relationship to one another, humbling ourselves, seeing our need for each other as brothers in Christ, and going after intentional discipling, intentional spiritual training. And so because that's our purpose, that's why Paul says in verse 25, therefore, put off the falsehood and speak truthfully. Don't fluff things up. Don't try to hide if you're not doing well. No, speak truthfully to your neighbor. We're all members of one body is how Paul ends this. He's saying, hey, we need to speak truth in each other's lives. Why? Because we're family. You guys here on this call and the guys that aren't on this tonight, we're part of our ministry. We are family in Christ. We share the blood of Jesus. And God is encouraging us and calling us to saying, speak truth, humble yourselves, go after discipling. And why? To become like God, which we were created to be like. Adam and Eve, they became like God in the wrong way in the Garden of Eden, right? They wanted that knowledge of good and evil. They ate from the tree. They, they did it their way, not what we should do. But God has said, hey, here's the way I want you to be like me. I want you to love like me. I want you to trust me, right? I want you to represent who I am in my nature. And we get the opportunity to do that. And so Paul says, hey, be that new creation, but you're gonna need men in your life to become that, that new creation and really to become like God, amen? So we need each other, but I wanna ask you, are you letting people speak truth into your life? Do you value it? Do you, do you invite it, right? Or does it take a while for that truth to come and therefore you find yourself in a cycle of sin, right? Do you go after help? Do you initiate getting help from other brothers? Not just your discipling partner or your official discipling group, but do you just go after help, giving people the green light to tell you how you can be more like Jesus. You know, I've definitely had times, just being real guys, like I've definitely had times in my discipleship where it hits me that I just have not been intentional in getting help. You know, whether that was when I was dating Hannah or when in our marriage, or whether that was just when I was a uh, campus disciple trying to learn how to study the Bible with people and just being prideful and not getting the help I need. I've had times where it just hits me like, dude, ask a question, <laughs> call someone up, right? Or if you need to confess your sin, confess it. God wants to heal you, right? We have these moments where God humbles us and he helps us see, man, get help. Be grateful for the one another way, right? Be grateful you don't have to do this on our own. Satan wants us to think and get us to do discipleship on our own which really isn't discipleship at all, but that's his goal is to, to isolate, right? To the point where we're all really not growing, even though we're, we're brothers in Christ. And so are you being humble or do you make it hard for people to disciple you, to help you grow spiritually, to help you become more like Jesus? Hope you guys are with me. I'm going to read these scriptures here kind of back to back. And I just want you to just be a sponge. And just take these in, all right? And, and if they convict you in any way, praise God, all right? James 4, verse 6. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. James 1, verses 19 to 21. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry. Notice it doesn't say everyone should be quick to talk. It says everyone should be quick to listen because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, notice that consistent theme, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Proverbs 12 verse one. I love this one, man. This one stung me in the past. Whew. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Say, say stupid with me. Stupid. 
All right, Buka, come on. Here we go, babe. Stupid. Come on. Man. When I was a kid, I thought stupid was a curse word. Stupid's in the Bible. And it's talking about people who hate correction. I don't know if we all love correction. I certainly don't crave it. I don't know about you, but I don't wake up. I'm not going to wake up Thursday morning tomorrow and say, you know what? I just want to get corrected today, man. Let me call up Manny. I know he could see something in me. He could correct me with, you know, let me, let me, let me call up Nary today. You know, I bet, I bet you he could correct. You know, I don't, I don't think about that naturally. I'm a sinner. I don't know about you guys, but I don't, I have to really pray. I got to go have a quiet time. I got to go on a prayer walk to get to a place where I genuinely want help and want someone to speak truth into my life. You're not going to wake up wanting that. But if you hate correction and you're not getting correction, you're stupid because you're not fulfilling your purpose of becoming like God and therefore changing the world. And it that just makes sense, right? We are being stupid when we're not becoming like Jesus. Because we're not becoming like Jesus, we're just becoming more like our sinful selves, right? And so we got to have a learner's heart, amen? But do you have a learner's heart? It's all about our attitude. I think that's a key word here, right? God's not saying you need to be this perfect, humble creature. He's saying, no, you're a sinner. You have pride. Be honest about it, but also acknowledge that, hey, you need help. And have that attitude, have that excitement that, you know what, it's going to be hard. I'm a mess. Uh, you know, I'm struggling with this sin and that's in, that sin. But you know what? I'm going to grow. Doggone it. I'm going to grow. I'm going to get help. I'm going to look ugly in front of my brothers. Why? Because there's a purpose for my life. And it's to become like Jesus. Right? We can't wait for people to speak truth into our life. If you're waiting for it, hopefully it'll happen. But am I not? Right? And again, we're not just speaking our opinions. We're not just saying, oh, here's my, no, it's people that know scripture. And also you going to scriptures, letting God's truth, wisdom, holiness, speak that into your life. Amen. You know, when's the last time, and this question's for me too, when's the last time you asked a brother in your life, this question, how can I be more like Jesus? What do you see in me? Now, that's a great question. And I think we got to make that part of our culture as we're planting this church for young people that we, as the men in this campus ministry, we ask that question on a monthly, weekly basis. Hey, bro, it's great getting time with you today for D time. Or maybe you're not even in a D group time, but you just go up to say, hey, bro, how, how do you think I can be more like Jesus? You know me. What do you think? That takes humility, right? But man, what a great question. And as you talk about it, they're going to share with you, well, you know what? I've, I've realized, bro, that you come late to things a lot. You know, do you realize that? Or maybe as you're talking, the brother helps you see, yeah, you know what, bro? I, when's the last time you were on a date? You know, is that something that is on your heart? to encourage your sisters, right? Or maybe the brother's saying, hey, you know what? I, I don't hear you talk a lot about what you're learning from the Bible. Like, what are you learning in your times with God, right? And maybe you are learning and the brother just doesn't know it. And you can have a great conversation about what you're learning, right? But we, we got to ask that question, how can I be more like Jesus? That's really what discipling is all about. You guys know this first Proverbs 27, verse 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Amen. We are called to sharpen each other spiritually. Not just you sharpening someone, but us sharpening one, each, one another mutually, right? So are you being sharpened in your relationships, or are your relationships spiritually dull, right? I've had relationships in the church that are just spiritually dull. I'm not sharpening the brother. They're not sharpening me. And I've had moments where I've had to tell brothers in my life, hey, like, 
I need sharpening and I'd love to just have that going on more in our friendship. And sometimes that might feel awkward to do, but, you know, I know for me, um, growing up with Matt Rupert and going through college together and being ministers together now, like we, we talk about that say, Hey, like, what do you think? What are you seeing? You know, and obviously Rob, as he's been discipling me for years, that's, that's something that I've learned and in, in learning to let him sharpen me and sharpening one another. But who's that for you? Who's sharpening you? And who are you helping sharpen spiritually? And again, that's just another way to say becoming more who God made you to be, right? A man of God. And, uh, you know, I do want to just take a moment to really, to lift you guys up and encourage you guys because, man, it, it's been a tough past couple of years for anyone who's trying to follow Jesus or be a Christian, especially in campus ministry. Um, you guys have been through a lot. You know, some of you guys are just going back to classes for the first time this semester in, in person. Um, some of you guys have had a lot of family issues, a lot of drama. Some of you guys have been sick. Some of you guys just have a lot going on in life and are feeling overwhelmed. And I just want to encourage you guys that you're, you're here. And, and I really do believe that overall, we've grown in just our friendships and really being in each other's lives. I've seen that. I feel that. I hope, I hope you do too. That compared to this time last year in 2021, and especially compared to 2020, I think we've really grown in our relationships. I think we've grown to be tighter. Uh, we've spent more time together. I think we know each other better, but we do have a long ways to go. You know, um, I think we've all grown to be like more like Jesus in different ways. I think we've grown in having more spiritual relationships. And so we're growing, but we certainly have not arrived, right? We definitely have not arrived. And so I think that some of, some of us here on this call and, and those who, who aren't on the call tonight, um, you guys need to grow in wanting to be discipled, not just as a campus student, but just as a man of God. You know, once you leave campus ministry, you're not going to really have someone or a leader or whatever trying to help you find a D group or find someone to really speak truth in your life. You're going to have to go after that. As you leave campus and go into young professionals and singles and marrieds, this has got to be your conviction, guys, that I need spiritual help. If you want to be a great uh, husband one day, if you want to be a great employee, if you want to be a great friend, whatever it is, we, we need that. And honestly, some of us here on this call wouldn't be having discipling times if it wasn't for your discipler reaching out. And so I think you have to think about that. Who should be the one initiating, right? And that's not to say that it's not wrong to, um, you know, know that maybe there's a group text or something where, or maybe you already have a weekly time that's in place. And so, you know, you're assuming that that's the time, but God is looking for us to be initiators. And if you find yourself not really thinking about your discipling each week or when that's going to take place or when you're meeting up, and again, it's not just about one meeting, but that is an important time to say, hey, when are we going to get an hour this week or an hour and a half? What cafe could we meet at? When are we hopping on Zoom? If that's not part of your heart and your initiative, and you're having to have someone else always set that up, I think that that has to show us something about our hearts, right? hope that makes sense. You know, it would be like, here's an illustration for you. It would be like a coach of a football team having to text his team every Friday night before their game and remind them they have a game tomorrow. It's like, he doesn't have to do that. The team's fired up to play. The team's fired up to get out on the field, to, to play together, to sharpen each other in practice, to be a team. And so that's, that's the attitude we have to have is we're there. We want it. We're excited to get time. We're excited to learn from one another. We don't need a reminder text. We don't need a lesson on discipling. It's just who we are. And when we have that attitude, that's when we grow. And so just some practicals that these are practicals as far as just going after discipling. And then I'll ask some questions here just to have some discussion. But one thing is just coming prepared. 
um, not just prepared to your weekly discipling time, but just prepared in general. Coming prepared to church on Sunday with questions you want to ask brothers about how you want to grow. You know, I want to lift up Buka. He, he texted me Sunday saying, hey, looking forward to talking at church on Sunday. And I said, looking forward to talking to him. And he had a great talk and fellowship. And then from that talk, he, we initiated and, and set up a phone call. And we had a great phone call this week, right? And, and that was so encouraging. You know, it was good for our friendship. Um, but that was Buka saying, hey, I, I want to connect. You know, I want to grow. And that's such a simple thing. But come prepared. You know, um, this is something that I had to work on just in my relationship with Rob and, and him discipling me and training me to be the campus minister is really intentionally thinking like, what, what questions should I ask? And it's still something I have to really be aware of and think about. Um, it doesn't come naturally. But another practical is just coming to encourage. You know, if you're in a D group or if you're meeting with a brother each week or whatever, or you're meeting for a Bible study, come to encourage. Come thinking about who's going to be there today. You know, what, how do I want to encourage them? Maybe it's something you saw, saw, the, saw them do, or maybe it's something you want to speak courage into them where they need courage, um, or they need courage to really overcome a sin, and you're trying to encourage them, right? Encouragement isn't just, bro, I love you, man. I think you're so cool, and thanks for being my friend. You know, I, okay, maybe that's what they need, but they might need a little more meat than that sometimes, right? Um, maybe there's a scripture, you know, maybe there's something more, but just come to encourage. And along with that has come with questions. And we've been talking about that. The last thing I'll say as a practical is, hey, raise your hand if you're a sinner here. Put them up, put them up, right? We sin. And, and as we sin, we need to confess, right? I don't know about you, but I, I confession is not something that comes, comes naturally. Um, it takes humility. It takes obedience to God, but James 5.16 says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Our prayers for each other are powerful and effective, and God wants to bring healing, but that's only going to happen when we confess and say, hey, bro, I messed up in my purity this week. I just want to get real. I need accountability. I need encouragement. God's going to bring you healing. And then we can pray for each other. It might be, hey, bro, I, I, I got really impatient at home with my mom today. You know, I just, I wasn't being like Christ and it really hurt her feelings and just want to confess that, right? This is just what we do as brothers, right? So that's just another practical is be a man that's vulnerable. Um, not just because you want to look vulnerable, but because you want healing and you want prayers and you want to grow. Amen. But if we're being honest, getting discipling and wanting it can be hard, right? Um, there's, there's things that get in the way of us really having great discipling relationships. And just for the last part of our time here, you know, it's only 816. I just want to have some good time of discussion. You know, there's not a lot of guys on here. A lot of us know each other really well. And I'm going to ask some questions and we could just talk about it and, and help each other um, so that we can, you know, this doesn't just have to have to be me talking. And so that the first question I just want to throw out there to you guys, and you can think about it for a second, but what can make it hard for you to go after discipling, to go after spiritual help? Right? What gets in the way? What makes it hard for you to do that? 